This was when you started peering eagerly through the windows, spying for the first glimpse of the club, the first hint of neon and mystery in the middle of this run-down urban desolation. The icy night air was vibrating with the bass beat of loud, loud, glorious music. Already I could see goths and metalers milling around, trench coats flapping in the night breeze. PVC-clad girls stalking the night in impossible, towering dominatrix boots, everyone's hair black as midnight. We headed towards that red and white sign like moths to a flame, and beneath it the building opened like a black, cavernous mouth. This time, this night, it was utterly different. Even before I spoke to a single soul, I knew I'd found my people. So welcome back, you wonderful people, to another story time from The Nostalgia Project, which is a selection of goth tales from the late 90s and early 2000s. And we are presently on chapter three. I will link the previous chapters below. However, it's not important that you see them before this video, really. The last chapter, chapter two, would give you some backstory on where we're going tonight, if you're ready to come with me, and the person that's coming with me, and things like that. That. So the last chapter you might want to see before this one, but if you're super keen to just go ahead, I don't think you'll be too lost. <laughs> um, I think it'll be all right. So I want to keep the intro on this brief and just get to the story because that's really what you're here for. But I do want to explain really quickly what I am trying to do with the Nostalgia Project, that since you guys have been so lovely about it, and honestly, this whole thing has been a suggestion from you guys, like you should start writing stuff about your life on the goth scene in the late 90s and the early 2000s and maybe maybe weave in the eating disorder forum and all the other stuff you talk about you should write about that and so I did and you guys were lovely about chapter one and I have been enjoying writing this so 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 much and I've been enjoying reading it out and the memories and delving back through that so at this point I am fairly determined to keep going and to write the entire darn thing I mean it's a book it's gonna take me some time so it's probably gonna take me about a year to finish this project when it finally comes out in its written form you won't have heard all of it because I there have been chapters that I've written that I'm not going to read to you because they're either too depressing, focusing on, you know, high school bullying and depression and mental illness and harm and just things that aren't jolly. And when it's a chapter that I read and I'm like, <laughs> afterwards, I don't, I don't want to read that out and be bummed out myself and have you guys be bummed out by it. So I only really want to read the chapters that are lighthearted and fun and enjoyable and I think that's going to be most of this project and then obviously there's going to be some chapters that are just too personal to want to put out there this way where anyone can just stumble across my video and see it and there's a lot of you guys now <laughs> um so those chapters if there are chapters that are too personal they might go patreon only or i may just leave all of that kind of stuff for the printed edition so the printed edition will be it will be a kind of richer more polished text than the stuff i'm reading you out but I am hoping to keep going all the way through this writing process, bringing you with me. So anyway, without further ado, this next chapter is called Edward's Number Eight. So in the last chapter, we had just finished getting ready, crimping our hair, draping ourselves in black velvet, spraying on Emily Strange 90s perfume. And uh, right now we are about to go for my very first time to the club that would absolutely change my life. And we are about to meet somebody who is probably the human being who has been the most special to me in my entire life. And writing this chapter has been kind of magical. And writing the next chapter is going to be... I don't know, dude. I don't know if it's going to be magical or heart-wrenching or what. Because it's so crazy when you put yourself back in, in the moment and you write... You write these things as though you're there again and the memories that come up are insane. Seriously, if you have any memories that you loved, whether or not you're a writer, whether or not you think you're any good, if you have any memories that you loved or people you miss, just, just try doing this. Just go back into the moments and just write and see what comes up and relive them and it's, it's magical. So anyway, I'm going to shut up now. Without further ado, this chapter is called Edward's Number Eight. Let's go. Have you met my cute little head bug yet? Isn't he sweet? 
he came from a goth festival. I was I was a little bit wasted and he just he was so cute. He looked at me and I had to have him. I had to take him home. Okay, anyway, I'm going to read to you now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Edwards number 8. As we drove towards the city lights on my very first foray into the world of Eddie's, the club that would change and shape my life in a million different ways, Jason sat as he always did, on the opposite side of the back seat. My stepdad drove an orange Fiat Multipla, a bizarrely adorable, lumbering beast of a car with a face that somehow resembled a placid amber dolphin. For us, following our decidedly awkward Stuart-induced breakup, it allowed plenty of backseat room to sit in total silence and ignore each other which I found preferable anyway. To this day, I hate talking to friends within earshot of my parents. They come from different worlds in my eyes. Friends and family, never the twain should meet. My feet were clunky, heavy in their metal-plated New Rock boots, mine black all over, Jason sporting red and yellow flames. New Rocks were a commitment in those days. They didn't have zips yet, so every time you put them on, you had three or four buckles to do up on each boot, and the same thing to struggle with drunkenly at the end of the night. I had just two clothing styles at this point. I either wore crushed black velvet down to the floor, and whenever the Sisters of Mercy sang, and a devil in a black dress watches over. My guardian angel walks away. I grinned all over my face and really felt the part. In the year 2001, a shapeless sack of badly tailored black velvet with slightly wonky bell sleeves and a lace-up cleavage slit was as uber goth as it got. I think one of the reasons for my obscene present-day shopping and hoarding habit has a lot to do with, in my therapist's words, addictions and eating disorders freezing me mentally in a teenage state. And my inner teenager is eternally mind-blown by the detail, the ornate materials, the swooping magnificence and grandiose uber-goth queen beauty of the clothes I see online. If I can even half afford them, how could I ever deny that kid? Even now, as they plant their skinny fingers all over my computer screen, spread-eagled across pictures of tattered evil queen jackets, demented black swan ballerina dresses, and corsets, 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 whispering, Want? Want that? Don't you have a credit card now? What's the point of being an adult if we can't have that? that. <laughs> so I buy them, I buy all of them, and then the bank sends me a lot of rude texts. But anyway, back then, crushed black velvet was as goth as it got, so good old velvet was my first style. My second style, and this was hardly a personal choice, it was simply all that was available on theblackrose.co.uk, the biggest and more or less only gothic clothing emporium available to UK goths. So this second style, in retrospect, it resembled a baby hooker attempting to look like a professional dominatrix. Short, black, gleaming PVC, strung with silver chains or held together with buckles, or run over with red, black light reactive detailing, glistening and tight and sexy. I even got my picture printed in Metal Hammer magazine at the age of 15, with the caption below it reading something like, Sexy ladies at the cradle of filth gig, Nottingham Rock City. Although, depressingly, I lost my copy of that magazine sometime in the ensuing two decades, so you'll just have to take my word for it. <laughs> I used to wear PVC a lot round Chris, largely because it saved my floor-length velvet skirt from being yanked entirely up to my waist in a total arse out in dignity whenever he went a-groping. On this first night out to Eddie's, however, I went for the black velvet. We were heading to a trad goth night, after all, and trad nights, for me, they always meant black velvet. 
and I was not alone in this decision, you could always identify the girls, more usually women, the original elder goths of the scene, who would stomp off the dance floor in a huff if dirty cyber bands got played. You could tell them by their predilection for crushed black velvet. Velvet, then as now, went along with proper goth trad goth incense and witchcraft and poetry not pills and red bull and goggles and always black velvet held a pint of snake bite and black in its gloved hand or snaky bee as it was affectionately known don't believe the tosh you read about absinthe no one drank that shit at goth clubs and i never even saw it at a party until a wealthy older friend bought us a full bottle of the stuff for Whitby Gothic Weekend 2001. The early goth scene was young, and that meant it was cheap, with a heavy childlike preference for everything sugary. Snakebite was formed of half lager, half cider, and the black was a good squirt of blackcurrant cordial, which gave it its gloomy, moody, purple-black shade. It was, and is, the British drink of choice for the proper goth about town. But don't be disheartened if snake bite sounds utterly foul to you. I've only ever tried the stuff once, at a Rachel Stamp gig. That wonderful, slutty little gender-bending glam rock band, beloved by the infants of the scene, and I have rarely been so drunk in my entire life as that single pint of snake bite got me, immediately followed by having to piss like a racehorse literally every five minutes for the next swirling, surreal hour. My skinny teenage body could not handle a pint of anything, much less alcohol. As for the taste, sorry, I don't even remember. <laughs> Overall, it was just not a practical drink for the gothic female, squished into a corset, stomach space limited, so shots of cinnamon aftershock or spiced black scorpion tequila were the lighter options and deliciously complimentary to a clove cigarette for the millennium-era gothic palette. Tonight, the endless row of sepia streetlights that lined the main artery pumping us like rich young blood from our whole town into the heart of the city. They swooshed by beyond the window as the Sisters of Mercy, some girls wander by mistake, spun in the CD player. Until I started driving myself, years later, my sense of geography was atrocious. I recognised no road anywhere, and so the drive always seemed strange and new to me. Streetlights whirling into neon-lit garages and kebab shops, then morphing into hotels and restaurants, until we were swerving around vast hellish roundabouts, cars jostling aggressively for position, neon-lit buildings rearing into the heavens, until finally, beyond the windows, came a light show of absolute chaos in a rainbow of lurid pulsating colours. My stepdad always took the most direct yet insane route and ploughed his vast orange car right down Broad Street on a Friday night, which speaking now as a native Birmingham driver is something you just do not do, ever. Drunken normals came falling out of bars on both sides of the jam-packed road, sometimes literally onto their asses, sprawling into the road braying with pissed-up laughter, sometimes stumbling directly into our moving vehicle to bang against the glass, roaring, Taxi! Taxi! To which my eternally good-natured stepdad would just laugh, shake his head and apologise while... I was the one to check the doors were firmly locked. I have yet to visit Bourbon Street, New Orleans, the infamous capital of on-street piss-headedness, but Broad Street at the weekend has got to hold a decent candle to its inelegant state of intoxicated, shame-laden, over-humanity. After a seeming eternity of this, crawling along, dodging the piss-heads, we turned towards the lights of New Street Station. Of course, I would recognise none of this back then. All I had was the address given out by NetGoth, searched up on a proper A to Z. There were no sat-navs, just my stepdad miraculously navigating the entire city and me trusting in him completely because my own internal compass hadn't grown a needle yet. 
All I saw that night were blurry neon roads, one after another, until we turned into side streets, then back alleys, and all grew darker. This was when you started peering eagerly through the windows, spying for the first glimpse of the club, the first hint of neon and mystery in the middle of this run-down urban desolation, the gloom of busted streetlights throwing the night into a fug of sepia-tinged light pollution amber. We knew the venue was up here somewhere, but where? This particular cobbled back street was so dark, so narrow, not even a real road, but already I could see goths and metalers milling around, trench coats flapping in the night breeze, PVC-clad girls stalking the night in impossible, towering dominatrix boots, everyone's hair black as midnight, and then, just behind them, I saw a sign reading, The Gallows. But this wasn't the venue. It was clearly a pub, not a club, and I had no interest in pubs. I wanted to dance, not talk. Apart from anything, it was strongly established that neither Jason nor I had a conversationally fluent bone in our bodies. So my stepdad edged the car further on, on up the narrow cobbled hill. And just as we began to think we'd headed into a total dead end, there it was. A tall black Victorian building sporting a lurid red and white neon sign declaring in distinctive art deco font, Edwards number eight. This is it, this is it, I squealed, reaching for the door, but my stepdad protested, you said it was called contaminated, didn't you? Contamination, I corrected with exasperation, but that's the name of the club night. Edwards is the name of the venue. I recall having to explain the same thing every single time we went out. Sometimes it was even more confusing, like seeing a band called Cradle of Filth, then sticking around for a club night called Death Cox or whatever the fuck, and all of it wrapped up inside a venue called Rock City. It was too many diabolical words for the parental mind to reliably imbibe. Right then, he conceded. See you out here in two and a half hours, I suppose? Yep, I told him, and I was off like a shot. Jason's new rock clunking footsteps following along behind. The icy night air was vibrating with the bass beat of loud, loud, glorious music. Some of the goths and metalers who'd been loitering outside the gallows, now strolling up the hill to the night's second venue. We headed towards that red and white sign like moths to a flame, and beneath it the building opened like a black cavernous mouth inky stairs rising steeply to the heavens, lined with glowing red and white piping, and all the way up the black walls were scrawled swirling white Tipex lyrics to every rock, metal and goth song known to man. This venue had been home to the misfits of the world forever, since the 1970s at least. Even Nirvana played here in their late 80s infancy, but we didn't know that, not yet. We heaved our hefty new rocks up the nearly vertical flight of stairs, reaching a landing on which a large desk stood, manned by a no-nonsense blonde rocker chick. There was a further flight of tall black stairs rising to our left, but it looked derelict, unused, probably staff only. So we paid our money and went through the open doors beyond the desk, where the ceiling was covered in shining steel that reflected the lurid neon lights around the enormous bar. We got our drinks, or rather, my drink and Jason's pint of goldfish piss. Then we took our seats opposite each other over a graffiti-scarred wooden table. And then we did what we always did, which was to ignore each other completely, Jason seeming to fall into a water-gazing coma, while I et up everything in the room with my coal-smudged eyes and waited for the DJ to play something, anything that I knew. I didn't even have to like it. I just had to know it. But the wait was to be a long one. Rock song after tedious rock song oozed from the speakers. We sat. I drank. We ignored each other. More rock songs dribbled on and on. This was getting embarrassing. I was the one with the info, the know-how on the goth scene, and somehow I dragged us to this f***ing 
shithole that wouldn't know goth if it walked right up and farted bats in its face. And then, just to make everything even more awful, this excessively intoxicated asshole with long blonde hair came staggering up and dumped himself down at our table, observing, You two love each other, don't you? I shook my head like a wet dog, aghast. Jason also declined, probably more politely. Nah, said the bloke. Nah, I can see it, man. You ain't fooling me. You two men love proper. You should kiss. Go on, just kiss her. She loves you, man. Young love. She's beautiful. I think this was the point I got up and danced to whatever the fuck they were playing, despite not knowing it from a Martian war dance. Once the song was over, that mysterious flight of stairs caught my eye through the doorway and a light bulb switched on above my head. I rerouted out of the door, caught the blonde girl at the desk's attention and asked her what was up there. Goth room, she stated. Is it open? I asked. Am I allowed? Sure, she said, seeming perplexed that I hadn't figured this out already. She took a card off the desk and handed it to me. An obvious newbie to the venue, it gave me one pound off the price of entry on my next visit and depicted a cartoonish kiss-styled rocker, his arm around a busty, pouting blonde, quite possibly styled on the woman standing right in front of me. I thanked her, then shot back into that ghastly rock room to alert Jason to my new discovery. Up this second flight of lethally steep black stairs we bounded, and there, finally, it stood. Mecca. Or, more accurately, Contamination. The actual goth night I had believed I was attending for the past tedious, baffling hour. The decor up here was darker, slicker but still pierced through with enough neon and black light to confuse a whole flock of moths. If you looked towards the bar, which filled the entire left-hand side of the long, dark room, it looked just like the White Rabbit venue from The Matrix. Slick, futuristic, cyberpunk. If you looked right, however, down the opposite side of the long room, you saw cosy booths with ornate backs, all in black and red, with vast, eerily realistic monochrome faces graffitied on the walls. Frankenstein, Bela Lugosi, Rob Zombie. Artistically doodled italic words scrolled across the blackness of the booths, whispering, the children of the night, what sweet music they make. And more than any of this, they were actually playing something I both knew and liked. Typo negative, my girlfriend's girlfriend. I ran full tilt for the dance floor, as much as anyone with skinny little legs can run in New Rocks. The dance floor, which rose on a stage at the end of the room, surrounded by misty, age-spotted mirrors that threw back tantalising hints of one's own gloomy, liquor-smudged reflection, abandoning Jason to presumably find another pint of water to drown himself in. The music went on all night, and I knew almost all of it. But as for the people, again, they were lacking. There were goths, of course, here and there, sitting in pairs in the booths, or propping up the bar, occasionally dancing opposite me. But there was no buzz, no crowd, no scene. And yet, just like I said, when you're that young, you have no expectations, no point of comparison. I didn't need people, not yet. Simply being somewhere with blackness and smoke and neon and the right music was everything. At the allotted time, we descended the 20 million steep black stairs and re-entered the orange expanse of my stepdad's car. I was elated, ears ringing, cigarette smoke, sweat and perfume saturating the crushed velvet of my dress, mentally recalling and listing the names of every song I'd been cool enough to recognise. I still remember the magic of those early nights, arriving home with that wonderful new stink still clinging to my velvet dress and crimped out hair. The aroma of a 2001 goth club is something impossible to recreate since 2006 and the introduction of the smoking ban. 
Back then, the clothes you'd been clubbing in had to be washed every time, so intense was the fug pong of cigarettes, but mingled in with it was clove smoke, perfume, hairspray, the strange ozone wafts of the fog machine, the lingering remnants of my Emily Strange black rose perfume, and, if you were lucky, the rubbed off aftershave of the boy you'd been kissing. In the nights when I still hung out with Chris, the smell of my clothes the next morning was intoxicating. I would sniff them long and deep, inhaling the last dizzying lungfuls of cigarettes and carling, pheromones and sweat and Chris's aftershave. Then I'd reluctantly toss it all out for my long-suffering mum to hand wash. <laughs> It was perhaps a month later, I think, that Netgoth popped up that fateful new club night listing. It was a brand new event called The Haunted Fish Tank, and it was shaping up to be the place to be, held at my equally brand new conquest, Edward's number eight. However, by this point, I was sick to death of the awkwardness of sitting in silence with Jason, my faithful pet rock. And even more than this, I was done with being cock-blocked by him. How the hell was I ever meant to meet my people when everyone in sight thought I was already taken and therefore wouldn't talk to me? How was I ever meant to fling off my embarrassing virginity if I didn't look single enough to bag someone to do it with? As such, once again, it was time to ditch the dead weight and go it alone. The night the haunted fish tank launched, however, everything went wrong. I got my period, felt bloated and grotesque, got a zit on my cheek and felt even more bloated and grotesque. Despite being a naturally skinny kid, I had dabbled in eating disorders for a year when I was younger and it took very little now to make me feel bloated and grotesque. So much so, in fact, that I had a dedicated outfit for these occasions. Out went the black velvet that swept off every line of my bloated body. Out went the tightly clinging PVC. And in came an oversized black and purple buckled gloss miniskirt and a loose-fitting blue-purple velvet jawdash top with long trailing sleeves. An item I still own to this day, solely because of the memories it would bring me, the people it would tie me to, on this one fateful night to come. My hippie witch attire was paired with striped purple and black tights, and my faithfully battered new rocks, instead of the newly acquired but decidedly lethal pride and joy eight-inch heel black gloss stripper boots, I loved those boots, but tonight I felt far too fat and uncomfortable to be tottering about on those stupid things. They were too sexy for me, and your boots should never be too sexy for you. Heading out alone. It was essential, I had decided, if I ever wanted to meet my people, my tribe. If I ever wanted to make actual goth friends who were capable of conversation and sex and drugs, and all the other things I wanted people for in the first place. But heading out alone again, after all this time, it was even more butterfly-inducing than usual. So I brought along my comfort blanket for the journey. Not a literal blanket, you freak. I brought Courtney Love, my idol, my tutor in being the baddest, most independent bitch on earth. Live through this, spun round and round in the car's CD player and the anxiety vultures swooped in my stomach, the journey seeming to take forever. Yet, when we got there, I sort of didn't want to get out at all. But there was no turning back now. This time, I had to queue to get in, loitering behind loud groups of goths and rockers who'd already found their tribes as we inched up the near-vertical staircase. Desperate to appear less sad and alone, I busied myself reading the graffiti on the walls. Finally, I made it to the blonde at the desk, used my money off card to save myself a quid, and headed immediately up the next staircase to the goth room. This time, this night, it was utterly different. Even before I spoke to a single soul, I knew I'd found my people. The place was packed out, 
goths giggling over bottles of Eddie's infamous rot gut red wine in the booths, goths swaying and weaving amidst the fog that drifted across the dance floor. And as I walked slowly through the room, scoping out everything, everyone, making my way to the bathrooms to check my hair and makeup, I recognised my first ever goth celebrities. Two girls were talking and laughing together right up near the dance floor. One looked sweet and innocent with round steel framed glasses, a cheeky grin and blonde ringlets draped in traily sleeved black velvet, while the other looked like a cartoon idealised gothic sex bomb, dark slanting almond shaped eyes cheekbones to die for, red and black hair swept up into high pigtails, and the best outfit in the entire place, if not the entire city, all metal plating, boobs and killer heels. And I recognised them both, instantly, could name them in a single glance. They were two of the stars of NetGoth, two of the profiles I had read the most often and avidly. The second girl, the sex bomb, she was Scary Bex, who even had her own website on the Darkwave server, plastered in photos of herself and the sweet little blonde known as Vampy, both lurking about in goth clubs all over the UK, hanging out in the Abbey at Whitby Gothic Weekend, living the life I would kill for and looking phenomenal every second of it. Scary Bex even had a little ank icon next to her name on NetGoth to show that she was a trusted moderator and overall a someone to pay attention to. As if those mischievous almond eyes and crimson streaked hair and high cheekbones and killer tits wouldn't get you there already. I wanted to say something to them. I felt like I already knew them a bit, didn't I? I'd been all over their website, staring at their photos. I knew their net names and their favourite drinks, and I thought they were cool as f***, but I was also a socially awkward nobody, and I didn't even know where to start when it came to conversing with women. So I passed on silently by, hiding my grin. There were real live goth celebrities in the same club as me. The bathroom was full of smoke and chatter, the Victorian building dated enough to have a literal powder room in the women's loos. There was the normal bit with its bathroom stalls, sinks and mirrors, but there was also an extra mini room and it had a dressing shelf with mirror, two chairs and nothing more, built it would seem for the express purpose of gossiping in. I wish more clubs would pick up this trend. The chill out room was always my favourite place to be and a gossiping bathroom is even better. But that room was full of the cool girls. Girls with friends to gossip with. I didn't even go in that bit. Not yet. The grimy bathroom mirror revealed my makeup to be fine or as fine as it ever was in those days, which was fine enough for 2001. Few people knew any better than to use foam pads for eyeshadow, regard blending as an alien concept, and it was so hard to find black lipstick that smudgy coal pencil applied to the lips was often as good as it got. Did I wear lipstick that night? I really don't recall. Lipstick was always a hell of a dilemma. I liked wearing it. It made my face look more severe resting bitch face as it would be dubbed these days but back then you just thought of it as goth as fuck intimidating dominating sexy and above all grown up pro tip kids everybody looks older in dark lipstick and younger without it <laughs> but the flip side of the dilemma was that if i wore lipstick then i met a guy I would want to kiss that guy and the result would be disastrous. Actually, bearing in mind the fact that I was on my period that night and thought I looked like a bloated hideous lump, my predicted likelihood of guy baiting would have been zero and as such, I was almost certainly wearing lipstick. So I guess I touched it up, bore the brutal sting and stink of lip coat, that utterly pointless accessory that promised to keep your lipstick kiss-proof all night, yet never pulled off the feet, 
Then I went back out to dance and wander, dance and wander, always on the move, never standing still enough for anyone to notice that I was alone, especially not tonight, with every goth under the sun in attendance, including, as I was sharply, perpetually aware, my eyes eternally drawn in their direction, the celebrity faction of Netgoth. The dance floor was packed all night, Goths puppeteered about by the magic of DJ Barrington Steel, or Barry, as we still know him these days. Always sporting a frilly shirt, a Lily Munster white streak in his flicked back hair, and spooky white contact lenses. As I danced, I looked around, trying to absorb the best moves of the Goths surrounding me, and loving it every time a loud would sound from the DJ booth and a fresh wave of fog machine smoke would make everyone disappear into a haunted woodland of dark twisting arm branches, shadows entwining in the mist. But the point that things actually got interesting was when, right at the ending of a song, somebody tapped me twice on the shoulder. I turned around to find a thin, beautiful blonde boy in smudgy eyeliner and black lipstick standing right in front of me. He leaned in to yell his name in my ear. It was Ash. I told him my own name, then expected, as one generally does, a conversation to begin. However, instead of saying anything further, the boy thrust something into my hand spun on his heel and was off. I followed after him, thinking he was leading me somewhere, but he moved at the speed of light, never looking back, disappearing into a herd of goths and vanishing from sight, then finally reappearing in a seat in the dark depths of one of the booths, flanked on all sides by young goths. It seemed obvious that he didn't want me to join him. He wasn't even looking at me. Weird boy. I looked down at the thing in my hand and discovered it was a torn off piece of the drinks list, biro scribbled with the words, call me if you like, no problem if you don't, A, followed by a mobile phone number. So he was bold enough to hit on me, uh, but too shy to stick around for the answer. Weird, weird boy. That night, I believe, was the 11th of May, 2001, just shy now of 20 years ago. And I still have that tattered, faded, yellowed piece of cardboard emblazoned with the very first words Ash ever wrote to me. It's locked away right now in the drawer right behind me, actually. Over the years, the decades, it's meant a lot of different things to me, that bit of scribbled cardboard. I always thought I'd show it to him someday, some special occasion, like, hey, do you want to see something really crazy? Do you even remember this? I, I still have it. <laughs> I always thought I'd save it, that silly reveal, for some time that mattered, right along with telling him something else. Telling him a great big secret that pretty soon I guess I'm going to tell you. Both these things, the secret in particular, I know would mean the whole wide world to him. Or they might have done in another life, another twist of fate. That little scrap of cardboard is perhaps the most bittersweet thing I own. If own is even the right word, for something as alive as a memory, for a piece of ancient trash with a beating heart, like a fetus that never quite got born, yet never wholly died either. Whatever it is, that thing, I know I'll keep it till the day I die. That's the end of this chapter. So, um, the next chapter is all about Ash, the boy from the club, and, uh, I will be uploading that one as soon as I have written the chapter and then read it out. Literally, I have the title 
and that's all. Um, obviously, I know exactly what happened, but um, I haven't put myself back in my little baby bat shoes and written it yet. But it's weird already how clear those memories are, um, because, yeah, I guess I'll leave it for the chapter. But um, Ash was, as we're calling him, that's not his real name, um, it just seemed appropriate. Um, <laughs> so uh, Ash was the first boy who really treated me with respect and then love. And for the bullied kid, that was the most surreal thing. The most surreal thing. You know, I mean, there'd, there'd been Jason, but it, it was so awkward with him. And there'd been Chris, but there was no respect there with Chris. I was clearly just this annoying teenager to him that he occasionally bothered to hang out with and grope a bit. Whereas Ash was a whole different thing. And there's so much to say, as you can probably gather from the last paragraph. So I will leave linked below the last two chapters in case you missed out on those and would like to catch up and find out who the heck these characters I'm talking about are. And uh, as I say on the end of all of these, if you would like to have some more of my writing, I do have a book of short stories out. It's not autobiographical. They're kind of gory, horror, vampire -y stories. Um, but that is out on Amazon. If you just search Amazon for The Putrescent Vein, um, you will get to that that's my book of short stories and uh the final thing i have to say is yes patreon if you were bothered by the censorship in this video i apologize for that uh, i explained it all in the last chapter that YouTube has been demonetizing all sorts of crap. But if you go to Patreon, the completely uncensored versions are on there. And the other benefit of being a Patreon person is that when there are chapters that have cliffhangers at the end, um, you get both of them on the same day. That's what I'm going to be doing is uploading kind of couples of chapters if they belong in a couple I will upload them both to Patreon and let those people binge watch whereas people on YouTube you will have to wait a couple of days or three for the next part to come out so I'm about to dive into writing about Ash which is going to be crazy and other people that I'm about to meet including including the uh the goth celebrities that we just talked about who <gasps> would actually become my friends and I still know them to this day which is why it's kind of so funny describing this this first glimpse of them that I still remember and still remember being so mind blown and they're both still amazing people but their lives have, have changed and grown as you would expect you know 20 years later um and it's it's kind of really weird and fascinating thinking back to then and to who we all were then and how different things are um <laughs> so it's been fun and I'm really looking forward to tomorrow diving into writing about Ash and oh it's gonna be oh it might ruin my makeup a bit but <laughs> anyway I'm gonna shut up now and uh hopefully you enjoyed this and you will be up for the next chapter so you might want to turn on notifications if you're keen to get the next chapter and find out why uh the little piece of cardboard that I still have that was Ash's introduction um is such a meaningful item to me um that will be coming but uh, anyway shutting up now because this is very long so uh hope you enjoyed over and out bye bye <laughs>